Please welcome Glenn Washer, Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Minis Missouri, Columbia. Okay, so this presentation, I've talked a little bit at some of the multi-telecons about this too, is a results from an NCHRP idea program um, project on to see if we could develop a deck sealer monitor that would tell you if you had sealer that was effective on a deck or not. And uh, start out with uh, just some background information, sort of who we are. So just to explain this, because it's done by a company called Thermalstare, which is a company I formed with a colleague I'd worked with for many years, Paul Fox. And so we both worked at Federal Highways back in the day in the 90s into just over the turn of 2000, during which time we worked for John Hooks. So he could have stopped all this at that time. <laughs> yes, <laughs> running around the country testing NDE stuff all over the place. But uh, then uh, I went to the university. Paul's had a private consulting firm for many years. We've done lots of research projects together. Um, he had an SBIR with Federal Highways on uh, thermal methods to detect coatings. Um, anyway, so, so he's got a private business and uh, he was doing this SBIR with Federal Highways on bridge, bridge coatings, paints, detecting uh, defects underneath coatings with uh, uh, infrared thermography. And we took that technology and we applied it to bridge decks using a lot of the same algorithms to find subsurface defects, and I'll cover a couple of that, a couple of things about that. That seemed to work pretty well, so we formed this company, Thermalstair. So for me, I'm basically a university guy, an academic. It is kind of a side gig for me. For Paul, it's the main thing he does. Just what we'll talk about today is uh, uh, what the problem we were trying to address was, a little bit about the background of it and the history, and then essentially what the testing we did during this idea project. Um, our expert panel from a different, couple different states, folks probably uh, I know a lot of these folks, but Ryan might even be here. Ryan Martin and uh, Ryan Bowers from, we're state DOT folks from Missouri and Wisconsin. Jeff Milton is with Virginia. And uh, Patty Leavenworth, who's with Massachusetts DOT, we're on the uh, oversight or expert panel for this, which all IDEA programs have. I won't spend a lot of time on the sealer because, uh, uh, problem because I think you're all familiar with it, right? The idea is that the, the sealers extend the life of your bridge deck, but you don't know when to reseal. There aren't good me methodologies to test in the field to see what the effectiveness of that sealer was. And so our idea was, well, maybe we could do that uh, with infrared thermography. And, and the way the idea really got born was, uh, we were doing some testing on a deck with this infrared system we use, which goes up on a mast. I'll show it in a minute, but it takes a big picture of a lot of areas of deck and takes lots of thermal images. And while we were doing it, this rabbit device showed up that does uh, uh, stuff on bridge decks that they use for a while with LTBP and started running around this bridge deck. And part of what that does is it drops a little bit of water on the deck to make a resistivity measurement. And so in all of our data, we had all this water that the rabbit had put on. And you can see like in this picture, uh, over here, it's going down this lane, then later it's going down the next lane, and the water from the first trip is starting to evaporate. I thought, you know, there's probably something there. What if we looked at water and watched how it evaporated? Could we do something practical and useful with that um, as a tool for evaluating bridge decks? Could we maybe determine if it was sealed or not? Because if you think about the idea of uh, penetrating sealers, that you're going to uh, protect the, the concrete from having water get absorbed into the concrete and seal the, the water out, and if that's the case and the water's sitting on the surface, then that, you would just think, would evaporate at a different rate than if it had been absorbed into the deck and then had to go by capillary action up to the surface and then evaporate. That those two things might look different if you, if you watched them over time and looked at their thermal behavior. I mean, it turns out it's true. This is kind of the end of the presentation up front, but, you know, we, we made these measurements. We started out first trying in the lab and then uh, a couple of field tests that I'll talk about just to look at the rate of, in our case, heating after the, it cools down. So this is actual data from a laboratory test result. You apply water to the concrete and it cools off and then it starts to warm up again as evaporation's uh, occurring and completing and if it's sealed, it, it warms up at a different rate than if it's unsealed. And uh, uh, this is on the left, some data from a laboratory, on the right, some data from the field. And so that's kind of what I'll be talking about and then we'll go through uh, backgrounds. This is kind of the results up front. So in terms of background, what is the technology that we're using? We're using this, what well, we named it, uh, ultra time domain thermography. So it's a transient thermal system. You put it up somehow above a bridge deck on a mast or on a light pole, or we have a cart you pull out and you launch a mast off the cart and it just sits there. And it stares at the bridge deck. And, and uh, we collect data every minute or less um, over a period of 24 hours. And so for thermography, which depends strongly on the time of day and the surrounding environmental conditions, well, we collect it all to over 24 hours and then process that data to make images that are, don't really show the uh, thermal data necessarily or the uh, temperature, but they show the rate of change of temperature. 
And so it improves the sensitivity of it. And so the idea is that you've got lots of pictures of the same area over 24 hours and just the ambient environment's warming up and then cooling off. And so you can look at what the thermal inertia of that deck is. And if there's subsurface defects, you'll see uh, those defects uh, uh, show up in this rate of change. And that, that's how that technology works. And it makes data that looks like this, kind of a plan view. You see about 240 feet from one position. You collect data over 24 hours and process that data. And what's shown in these images is the rate of change of temperature on the bridge deck, not the temperature. And so it becomes more sensitive. You can see things that are deeper, see-through overlays. Like this is an example here from uh, underneath a two and a half inch overlay, a delamination at the rebar level down three, three and a half inches deep. And so you can work through different types of overlays, even asphalts and things like that. And uh, uh, again, it's a transient method. It's different than conventional thermography. And it was, it was pretty successful. It was an SBIR uh, program I mentioned. Um, it won an award as an SBIR uh, success story and also a Tibbetts Award, which is an award given across all of the uh, government agencies to the best uh, SBIR pro programs. And this one, this project uh, developed two technologies. One looks at coatings, uh, defects under coatings, and we took that same technology and modified it to look at delaminations and bridge decks. And the delamination and bridge decks, this large thing was also awarded a patent. Okay, so our idea was to take this technology we're using and see if we could use it to measure the effectiveness of a penetrating sealer in a bridge deck. And there's lots of different ways to seal and overlay bridge decks. Really what we're looking at in this first project was just, you know, is it sealed or is it not sealed with some sort of a penetrating sealer? And there are methods, and I think there's uh, folks talking yesterday um, uh, from uh, UM in Kansas City about the different test methods you have for assessing sealers on samples in the laboratory, but there really isn't a good one for the field. And so we were interested in seeing, could we do one that, have one that we could do in situ in the field so you could see how it's actually performing on the bridge deck, or at least if it's effective or not. And you could use that for, say, quality control at the time you were sealing the deck to make sure the deck actually got sealed, since you can't really see it once it's applied. Or when to reseal a deck, how effective is the sealer at this point in time in order to make decisions about what your preservation actions ought to be. Okay, so that's the background, and we started out with laboratory testing. Unfortunately, the whole project was uh, during the pandemic, and so we started out with plans to test some concrete samples we had at Virginia DOT um, from some previous testing we'd done, but with the pandemic, we couldn't get to those. And so we ended up starting out just testing uh, some concrete pavers you might buy at Home Depot to put in your yard or something. And it was an imperfect sample to start with, but it was what we had given the circumstances of uh, not being able to travel and things. We thought, well, that's a very porous material, so maybe that's a good uh, place to start since we don't have any idea whether this is going to work or not. And just get some proof of concept testing going and seeing, and then, you know, if we can de develop something from there. But it turned out that that actually worked um, with a little bit of uh, muscle kicking around to it. Uh, to make it work. And so what we're t showing in this first one is uh, there's six of these panels shown there, but there's really there's a duplicate set because we're researchers, so we're always into getting multiple results that we can repeat and average and things like that. So, um, and the, the three different uh, uh, panels here, one is totally unsealed and doesn't get wet. One is sealed and we're going to get wet. One is unsealed and we're going to get it wet. And the one that's totally unsealed and doesn't get wet is so like a normalizing function. So we can normalize the data and that's uh, and develop an algorithm to try to find what the differences are. And so if we look at this um, here, this is again like what I showed earlier. Um, you know, you apply water, assuming that the water is cooler than the bridge deck in this case. It causes the deck to cool down and then at some point there's sort of a knee down here and it starts to warm up. And that, even that has a couple of different uh, uh, characteristics to it. And this is raw data that we take, took here, not in our lab, but outside our lab under ambient conditions um, in Northern Virginia there. And then this is consistent with stuff that you know, people have done previously with porous materials, um, usually done by mass, right? There's some sort of a knee in this evaporation curve that uh, uh, in this case, if you're measuring the mass of an object, it starts to dry out at a higher rate, then at some point that rate changes and there's a knee in the curve. And we're really looking at that. What is the knee in this curve and what is the, uh, the rate of change in this first part from the time it gets coolest? Now, the original data here is on the left. What we see, and I'll just back up a little bit to, to explain this, is that you know an infrared camera is uh, sort of like a regular camera, but not really like a regular camera because it's made up of a defined number of pixels, um, and each of those pixels holds a 14-bit uh, number. And so when you take it at thermal image, uh, each pixel is some number that they convert to temperature, and it's a huge, you could look at it as being a huge matrix. And so if you took lots of pictures at lots of different times, you have lots of these 
huge matrix with 100,000 elements in them, each pixel representing uh, the temperature at that point, at that point in time, um, but in a 14-bit number. And so we're researchers and we build the systems actually that we, that we test, and so we work with the numbers all the time um, rather than the temperatures. But, uh, and so on the left axis over here is a photon count, you know, because if you increase the temperature, the number of uh, photons in the infrared range goes up, and that's what we're measuring. You can convert that to temperature. Someone was asking me yesterday, what are the units of this, and well, what units do you want? Right now we do it in IR counts, because that's a basic of how our system works, but you can calibrate that to a separate number if you wanted to. That's how thermal cameras work. They get it in counts, and then they convert it to a temperature to show it to you. So um, anyway, so this is what the raw data looks like for an individual pixel which is what we do, look at one pixel or one group of pixels um, over time. And the horizontal axis here is time. As the time goes by and it begins to evaporate, we have to suck out of there the uh, normalization function and we end up with a curve that looks pretty organized like this, okay? And uh, that's by taking out the uh, uh, normalizing disk that we have out sitting out there in the same environmental conditions. And you see the same sort of data here with a kink in it and there's an initial rate, okay? And so we really have an algorithm that looks at that initial rate right in that first window. And you can apply this across an image, but it's a little more difficult because there's a lot of noise. Here is uh, three different tests sort of working from right to left. Um, the red one indicates it's sealed, blue is indicate, light blue is indicating unsealed, and then there's normalized one is over here on left that's totally blue. Um, on top here is what the uh, 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 data looks like in a conventional infrared camera. If you just, you know, we take pictures every 30 seconds or whatever time interval we choose, but they're all just thermal images. If you look at the thermal image, it looks like this. The two de de decks don't look any different. You look at the transient data um, over time, where it's, what we're representing here is the slope over time, not the thermal data itself, and you see uh, which ones are sealed and which one is unsealed and which one is the standard, okay? So we did that with that, the test laboratory sample. We looked at this in different ways, but mostly the, uh, the rate in that first time interval from the time it hits the bottom till it comes up to the first knee and compared that for unsealed and sealed decks. And so what you see in this graph here is the uh, unsealed regions are these orange ones and the sealed regions are the gray ones. And then this little brown one here is the ratio of one to the other. And so in these different tests, we get different uh, magnitudes, but the ratios stay pretty consistent. That, you know, so you can sort of think about that being normalized, that we've got a higher rate in a sealed deck than we do in an unsealed deck, and that's pretty consistent across different positions. So that was a proof of concept. Um, it was just an idea we had, and so I think that you know, we were pretty, pretty happy that we managed to pull that out of it. And we ran a, number of, a couple of field tests as part of that to see what would happen. Well, what if we took this out of our controlled condition and tried it on a real deck? And so we installed the system here. The system includes a mast and some uh, uh, computer sort of controls and a large battery that makes everything operate autonomously. So you put it up, and the common way to do it is to put it on the parapet. Um, we have a, like a parapet mount, it clamps on, and then about an hour you launch up this uh, mast, leave it up there and collect data with it. And this is kind of what it sees, it's sitting up there at 35 feet above the deck, and it's got a pan and tilt camera so you can kind of look around. And we did a couple of bridge decks, uh, which I'll show a little bit, a few more details about here. R bridge one was Old K, it's a small bridge near campus in, there in Columbia, Missouri. Uh, bridge two was a route over, sort of a local road over Route 22 over Route 63 which is a north, 63 is a big north-south road near, you know, near University of Missouri. It goes from Jefferson City up through Columbia and then up into Iowa. Then. So the first test bridge we did, actually only por a portion of the bridge that we were gonna seal so we could see at the same point in time, a sealed deck versus an unsealed deck on the same piece of deck. And so we did this and one of the good things about being an academic is you get these students and the students graduate and they have real careers. And so the city, uh, the city engineer in Columbia is a former graduate student of mine. And so I told him I wanted to seal only a small portion of one of his decks, and he said, sure, you know, go ahead. It's not, well, how can it hurt? And so we sealed, he let us seal just a quarter of this deck. And so you see in this picture here, um, the area that's sealed, our camera device is set up over here, just behind a railing. We put this on by hand, just using a, a sprayer. This is Seth, he was a like, graduate student uh, during an old pooled fund study. Some of you guys might have remembered about infrared thermography, now he's a city engineer in Columbia. And so we did a quarter of this deck. And then a local uh, contracting company, again, who's, uh, who are uh, alumni of the university, came by and sprayed it with water for us. And unfortunately, the day we did it, their truck was malfunctioning. They couldn't spray it with the sprayers in the front of the truck. All they could do is release it out of this sort of pipe on the side. And so, 
we thought, well, we don't even know if it matters yet, so let's just try it. We're just experimentalists out in the field, just as long as you get all the deck wet, okay? It took about seven minutes to put water on that deck, and that deck was never closed to traffic or anything. It just stayed open the whole time. The second deck was a more busier route. This is kind of a rural onto a feeder uh, uh, highway. MoDOT was going to seal this deck. It had been sealed more than 10 years ago, so it was due for resealing, and they had plans to seal it, so we got involved with them and got involved with their sealing process in order to go out and measure it when it was in its unsealed condition and then wait, and they sealed it, then wait a day, and then test it in its sealed condition. So we'd have sort of before and after. And they applied water with their bridge washing truck that they use as part of their normal sealing operations. You go out and wash off everything in the deck, try to clear the sand off. And so when they did that, we collected data on it in its unsealed condition. And then they came back, and they, for, for us, they wet the deck again once it had been sealed. And it was, there was some traffic control for when the water was actually applied, but then it was pulled off, and the bridges were open to traffic. Quick summary of the results, I think I'm... And we look at this in terms of uh, final results. And so, as I mentioned, we, we wrote an algorithm that goes in and automatically looks at these pixels that we define a range of, like, one square foot, and look at all the pixels in that square foot and define whether it's sealed or unsealed according to these uh, rates of change. And so... We didn't change any of that for all these tests or what the thresholds were. We just ran it to see how it was going to work out. Um, the green boxes here are where there is a, a sealed section of the deck, and our algorithm says it's sealed. A red box means it's unsealed, and our algorithm said it was unsealed. Uh, we had a couple of uh, places in the unsealed that are kind of difficult to see. I think there's three of them where we couldn't get, make a decision based on our algorithm. It didn't show a result that, that you know, made sense. So there was some noise in that. Um, but we did see a consistent ratio of the sealed to unsealed decks in terms of the evaporation rate. And they were slightly different um, in the two, uh, uh, the two lanes, and we're not quite sure about that, why that was, actually. And then the second deck, which was, partially un which was totally unsealed when we began, um, these are the results of data we collected when they washed off the bridge deck. It came in as unsealed and according to what our algorithm was, again, looking at the slope in this first... Uh, section and what the rate of change is during the warm-up. And this was uh, pretty bad weather for this testing. It was actually in November. It was very windy. Um, so we were happy we were able to get a result out of that at all, not knowing too much about it. And then they sealed the deck. We waited a day or two for that to cure, and then they came back and they re-wetted the deck. And we ran this algorithm again, collecting the system just stayed in place, mounted on the side of this parapet here. Um, and in this case, we got mostly right with our algorithm. There was two spots that showed up as unsealed, even though they should have showed up sealed according to our thresholds that we had. And those, the thresholds were developed from the laboratory and then used in the field without changing, so they were consistent. And it turned out that two of the spots looked like they were unsealed when they were actually sealed in this, in this post deck. But for most of the spots, that came out uh, true. And then you look at this. We did get different, uh, slightly different values, but the ratios of the two uh, maintained pretty consistent. And you can see there what we used as the sealed threshold. And again, we use that uh, consistently through both our tests and our laboratory tests. If you just look at these two sealed versus unsealed together, in the unsealed condition, we got 100% of those spots right. Uh, they were all below our threshold. In the right-hand side, the uh, sealed deck, we got uh, the majority of them correct. Two spots, two regions in there turned out to look like unsealed decks. Just to, that sort of shows you the research. You know, I think our key finding was we were able to develop this method, which started out as just kind of an idea, which is a good thing for the idea program. There weren't any methods to directly measure uh, sealers on bridge decks. We developed one. This worked in the field pretty well. It was about 90% accurate, according to our uh, first two field tests. And that may be a number that I never changed, because that's a pretty good number, <laughs> so 90% for the first time out. Um, so there was a couple of inaccuracies in there, but generally it worked pretty well. Uh, we developed a procedure and algorithm to implement the method, and we did a couple of in-service highway bridges. Our testing took a few hours because we didn't you know, know what we were doing, frankly. We were try trying this, um, but it was uh, less than an hour to do it in the end. Uh, wet it down and then watch it dry, and it dries within an hour to run the whole test. We collected data for like four hours, but uh, three of the hours turned out to be not what we needed. What we needed was the thing that happens in that first hour when it hits the base and comes back up. Implementation of this technology, well, one of the interesting things you could do with it was you could evaluate your sealer and look at the delaminations in the bridge deck at the same time, because since it's exactly the same technology, all we're doing is we're using all the same hardware and software and everything to collect data that we do to find subsurface defects or delaminations. We're just applying a different algorithm to the data when we get it out on the other end. It could also be developed as a localized tool if someone wanted to do something less uh, large in scale. 
Um, we do do our technology sometimes for a smaller area, like this is looking at coatings at a, a Navy ship around where the uh, F-35 lands to look at defects in the coatings where the F-35 lands. So that's a real localized measure. You can see this, okay, you could do this on a smaller thing with a handheld camera. In our future work, and this is my last slide, is we're now looking for support to try to get some additional testing. This is a, like I mentioned, it was an idea program. We got a, a funding for a, a small project just to try it, and now we're trying to pursue some additional uh, funding in order to develop uh, the technology further and get some uh, additional testing of it. And with that, I'm, I'm done, sir. Any questions? I, I don't know if I understood that correctly. So you uh, sprayed silane sealer on the bridge deck and then put water over that sealed area to test for the evaporation. How long after the sealer was put down did you then put the water on it to, to run that test? It was a day or it might have been two days in one case, but it was 24 hours afterwards or more, yeah. Depending on the conditions or whatever, sometimes that reaction with the siling to the concrete can take three, four, five days to fully cure out and to fully perform. So it might be something to, to consider. Yeah, that's uh, something to consider. I mean, we were pretty successful with uh, at least telling the difference between uh, sealed and unsealed, but there's a lot of stuff you could mine for there. You know, we didn't really look at, you know, 50% sealed or anything, right? We just looked at one threshold. So there's a lot of area you could cover in there. Maybe, you know, waiting longer. I mean, if you just walked up to a deck, you didn't know the condition, that would be the situation, right? Thank you, Glenn. Very interesting. All right, thank you. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.